Is everybody on the big place on the screen? You're good to go. Okay, sounds great. Um, thanks everyone for joining again. Um, I'm David Wyshynski here with Handel Architects. Um, be the uh, co-chair of the new um, or the uh, revamped um, place uh, placemaking group here with um, placemaking network we are called with the BSA um, and Emmeline Gojak is my co-chair uh, to do a brief introduction here before we jump into this since we have an exciting lineup of folks to talk today um, I think as we're as we're kicking this off um, you know we had a few thoughts for this group um, I think that for us the placemaking network has a potential to be um, Sort of an active participatory group so we, we enjoy having discussions around um, placemaking in various different forms for whether it's a sort of permanent place in the city or or more temporary pop-ups and other community engagement projects but um, also thought this could be an interesting forum for um, doing some actual work in this around the city um, you know the city of boston and some other groups and nonprofits. there's some opportunities for um, engagement around placemaking. So we're looking to think about doing some of that work with, um, you know, whether with cities or community groups or with developers. And I think we'll touch on some of that in today's presentation. So um, there's a chance to sort of be uh, actively engaged in this sphere as well as um, in sort of sharing and sharing, you know, these sort of presentations around projects. So I'm kind of excited about that. Let's see if this goes to next slide. So we'll do a brief introduction on on, on us for the um, the team here, the two of us that are the new the new co-chairs. Um, like I mentioned, I'm working with Handel Architects, so we're um, currently doing. This is a brief intro of things I'm up to recently. This is a project that we're working on now. This is the Two Harbor project in the Seaport area. It's ten-story life sciences building. Um, has a it's on Northern Ave and has a decent sized park and plaza in front of it. So uh, to me, it's interesting not sort of just putting the building together, but creating a, a space to give back to the community in the city. So it's a uh, place that folks in the building can go for lunch, but also the neighborhood can go and it's a nice sort of green open space. So something that I enjoy the that type of project that we give something back to the community. Um, yeah, otherwise, besides being stuck inside the house, um, I'm going out a lot with my dog and my wife into the snow. Um, and recently, I've been reading um, this hip hop architecture book by Seku Cook about uh, thinking about, I've always been a hip hop fan, so I'm trying to, I hadn't thought of merging hip hop with architecture. So thinking about some thought ideas on, on that and, and what that can mean for architecture focused kind of permanent and temporary projects in the city. So that's kind of my current, currently what I'm up to. Uh, let me pass it over to you, Emily. Hi, I'm Emily Gojak, and I am the other co-chair. I work for PCA Architects. And um, in my professional life, I do a lot of different project types, but currently right now I'm doing um, exploring placemaking as it relates to the ground level interacting in a re really unique project site in Revere Beach bridging between the marsh with Copley Wolf and then exploring how we can make placemaking kind of more engaging on the upper levels for the residents so exploring how that can be in some interesting new concepts for the community and then as well in my free time, I like to do a lot of hands-on placemaking. So this is a project I did actually with the BSA and the City of Boston partnership to encourage the use of policy that would encourage the use of outdoor seating. This was pre-pandemic, which worked out really perfectly for um, when all of a sudden <laughs> these started popping up in the city. So this was built basically right at the start of the pandemic. So really helped out that restaurant. Um, and then I'm reading a book about how uh, the psychological um, and physical effects the built environment, what we do every day has on, on people. Um, and it's a really interesting book and applicable to everything we do. Um, so I highly, highly recommend it. And you can uh, stop sharing and we're gonna jump into this meeting. 
Uh, I just wanted to share a little bit about the subcommittee, which is the second goal of this meeting besides learning some wonderful inspirational um, projects and lessons learned from our great lineup of presenters. Uh, from this meeting, we hope to capture a group of people from various wide professional backgrounds that would really make this group much more powerful than just David and myself being the co-chairs. Um, we would try and meet monthly and we would plan events together, um, whether it be just informational shares or uh, field trips or projects and partnerships with the city or community groups, just really a knowledge resource for our local community and trying to enrich um, what we bring to our, you know, every professional background, not just architects, but landscape architects and developers and community groups. I think involving, as you'll see, this group of presenters with wide professional backgrounds, that was kind of the point of why we, we captured these people and got this lineup is we're much more powerful as a group. Um, so please contact David and I. We're going to post our information in the chat if you'd like to join the subcommittee. Um, like I said, it'll just be a monthly meeting of a bunch of great people talking about placemaking and um, sharing some great knowledge. So without further ado, uh, David will introduce the first presenter. Great, thanks. Um, so I'm uh, I'll do a brief intro for, for Jonathan. Uh, this is Jonathan Evans is a uh, principal and licensed architect with Mass Design Group. Um, he's worked on a range of projects from affordable multifamily housing plant to um, planning and urban design work for nonprofits and public agencies. Um, but his through line has always been a focus on initiatives with measurable community value and public interest. Uh, Jonathan's currently working on building out Mass's portfolio in affordable housing projects. Um, including developments in or upcoming developments in Cleveland and Brighton. And Jonathan's also a mayoral appointee to the Boston Civic Design Commission, uh, where he serves on that panel that reviews significant projects that are impacting the city's public realm. Uh, but today um, we're going to be, well, Jonathan is also the project manager of the new memorial dedicated to Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King in the Boston Common. Um, and that's what we're going to be excited to hear about today. So uh, Jonathan, yes, go ahead. Yes, thanks for the intro. appreciate that and uh, excited to be here. And yeah, I probably, um, so I'm Jonathan Evans, principal of Mass Design Group. Uh, we are sort of socially minded nonprofit, really understanding issues of equity and justice in the built realm. Uh, and, and yeah, definitely here today to talk about the King Memorial in, in, in specific here. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, hopefully you're not seeing my desktop and you're seeing the presentation. Again. All, right. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get going here. Again, thank you for uh, inviting me. Excited to talk through the memorial here. Um, uh, so again, this memorial, uh, again, it's a memorial to Martin Coretta, uh, and in some ways the largest civil rights movement in Boston as a whole. And I think one of the exciting opportunities really is how do we make this a place, right? How do we take this monument, and create this kind of call to action, uh, right, the, right at the front door of Boston on the Boston Common. Uh, just a little bit of background uh, about the project and about, about the sort of inspiration here. You know, Martin and Coretta, uh, they met in Boston. They fell in love here. They started their life's work here. Uh, and, and so the opportunity to create a memorial that really honors them and honors Boston's uh, role in this movement was, was, was exciting or is exciting. Uh, again, the memorial really embodies the work of King Boston, a nonprofit that's emerged to kind of create this uh, memorial and a sort of a string of programming that kind of comes from it as well. Um, Again, an opportunity to really honor Martin and Coretta and also Boston's place in a larger civil rights story here. Uh, and then really from a, a, a placemaking lens, this, really, this product is an opportunity to really elevate values of equity and racial justice and really put them on the front door uh, of Boston on Boston Common. Uh, again, just a little bit about the process as a whole, uh, King Boston, as they sort of embarked on this, there was, a, a, again, about a dozen community meetings. Uh, it ultimately became an invited competition uh, with hundreds of entries. Um, uh, again, finalists were displayed publicly at the bowling building, and then our uh, mass design group, along with Hank Rose Thomas, was selected as, as the winner uh, of this memorial. Uh, one thing to actually keep to, to, to think about um, when we talk about place here is there was a, a pretty uh, intense conversation around where does this memorial want to be? Does it want to be 
uh, in Roxbury, you know, 12th Baptist Church where their work was? Is it in the South End where they lived? Is it like, where, where does it make sense to have this? And uh, again, ultimately the, the idea of, of putting it uh, at a place like the common uh, uh, really resonated as the idea to really bring these values to the, for to the forefront uh, of, of the city as a whole. Um, so talking a little bit about our proposal or our, our project here, the Embrace, again, really this idea of, of responding to this call to action uh, uh, to sort of elevate these values, uh, really with the, with the idea of love, just kind of uh, uh, as, as hokey, as, as, as cheesy as that might sound. Um, uh, and we were really inspired by this quote from Coretta, uh, the, and I'm not going to read it, I'll, I'll leave it on the screen here, but it's really about the idea of what it of, of the value of love as something as, as a as powerful force that really kind of propels people that's called action actually want to make meaningful change sort of finding a way to sort of memorialize that or sort of uh celebrate that in the, in the public realm uh and so then in partnership with Hank thomas i think you know the, the the sculpture became in some ways this translation of this photograph which is uh the, the, this picture of martin i'm going to go backwards here martin and coretta kind of embracing uh, i believe this was taken after he won the nobel prize uh, again, taking that photo and spatializing that became the uh, the inspiration of, of the form here. Um, and I, I, again, I think one of the things that's really exciting is, is creating this you know 20 plus foot tall bronze sculpture that uh, uh, again, as iconic it is a sort of it, 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 it inspires inquiry. You want to sort of get into it. You want to know what it is. You want to engage it. I think that's really the hope is you 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 come into this thing, you come around this thing, you actually come into the center, it's open to above to become this sort of oculus. Um, and one of our charges really in working in our, our partnership with Hank really is, okay, how do we take this sculpture that and the space that we've kind of worked together to create and, and ground this in a public realm or in, in a space uh, in Boston? Uh, so this kind of, this view here, this elevated perspective here really, um, uh, Starts to sort of show some of the the pieces coming together here. Again, I think the the big one of the big uh, tasks here was to sort of take cues from and really respect and have a dialogue with the context of the common. Uh, in some ways, how do we both kind of blend in and respect the order of the common, but still unapologetically distinguish itself as a place that is of um, telling a, a different story or, or telling a story that 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 needs that that wants to be uh, distinguished from the rest of the common in some ways. Um, so again, one thing you can see in this view here is we're really starting to kind of uh, tie this thing into the network of paths. I think that, that, that'll come up as well in a plan view. I'll show up the next slide. Um, uh, again, the idea, the use of granite being a material that uh, is common to the vernacular of the common, but also looking at the, the distinct finishes that we're, we're applying here as something that has its own uh, unique uh, form here. Uh, two other pieces that are sort of part of the moral here again we have this, this large central plaza uh this uh curved bench quote wall again that is a place to sort of sit it's also a place where we're hosting that quote in Coretta um that again frames the the, the plaza uh again zooming back out kind of a, a vicinity plan here so you've got I don't know if you can see my mouse that's Parkman bandstand uh King spoke there um and it's rally 1965 uh the visitor center is here he also spoke at the state house here as well. So we were very much interested in being along that path in some ways connecting the dots between the bandstand, the state house uh, uh, with our memorial here on this plaza. Uh, again, looking kind of from a formal perspective, uh, you know, at, at the sort of the, the, the language or the topology of memorials and the common, uh, again, we worked hard to coordinate with the with, uh, parks department, friends of the public garden, uh, landmarks that sort of understand what is it about uh, what we memorialize and how we memorialize that in the common that, that resonates and we want to bring to this project here, the idea of kind of creating these nodes, these access points to the nodes became part of the driving force of the form of this thing. Um, it's funny, I, I kind of throw this in here um, as kind of a, a as an aside that when, you know, when we, when the announcement was made, this was one of the sort of prominent images of the project that we all kind of cringed that a little bit. And you know, admittedly, we made the image, but um, we didn't intend for it to be kind of a, a celebrated image of the project because it, it doesn't really indicate anything about the place. It's not evocative of anything other than um, uh, the sculpture. So really, our um, as we work through this more, as you really kind of went from competition to project, the idea of how do we make this place worthy of the sculpture, worthy of Boston, was, was the challenge. Uh, and so here, I think this, this image starts to show that a lot better. Um, really the idea of, again, we have this central plaza, 
nestled within the tree canopy, um, again, very much within the flows of the comet. It's placed um, at, uh, at a particular location is off of Railroad Mall and, and, and uh, the Mayor's Walk, two of the more prominent paths in the common. So the idea that it becomes part of your everyday experience of the, uh, of the park um, was, was something we were really excited by. Uh, and then kind of a night, night shot here. Again, you see the bandstand in the background. Uh, again, I think we really like how we have this significant memorial at a significant scale, but at, at the same time, uh, you know, we're setting it low within the plaza, working with the topography to, to make it really feel like it's grounded and nestled. Um, so there's an intimacy as well uh, involved. Uh, and this view is slightly out of date, but again, really starts to show some of the parts we're talking about. Again, the, the, the sort of access paths coming in radially off the edges here, and again, the sort of circular plaza. Um, one thing that I'll talk about in a second, um, again, the form of these things has changed, but we, we are talking about having these markers within the plaza that are uh, opportunities to acknowledge and celebrate other significant civil rights heroes in Boston. Uh, and again, just, just in terms of the context and what we're talking about here, again, this was a significant, this, this is not just a memorial to Martin Credit, it's a memorial to, uh, in many ways, the larger civil rights uh, uh, story of Boston. Uh, again, so this is, this is a, a shot from the March of 65, again, realizing that there is a, um, you know, talking about place is, is there's a physical manifestation, but again, there's a, a larger story beyond just physical geometry. This understanding of history that have happened, of what happened here is something that we wanted to uh, celebrate uh, with, with this project. Um, uh, again, one of the things that we are also very much inspired by is this quote from Martin, uh, this idea of this garment of destiny, the idea that we're all sort of tied together, this linking, this interwoven stru uh, structure that became a way to also inspire what we're looking at doing with the uh, the the actual design of the ground plane. Um, so you can sort of see it starts to show up here uh, this idea of acknowledging this tradition of African American quilting um, as a way to create difference to create a pattern or a texture within the landscape itself. Um, again, this is just uh, initial mock-ups, so we can we're really sort of trying to sort of create this landscape that really blends together. Um, collectively. And again, here you can even see us selecting, uh, again, this is sort of part of our submittal review, but even just sort of selecting each stone to understand the finish of it and how it creates this larger tapestry um, uh, in, in the common. And again, it's granite, a material you see in the common, but again, how we treat it, how we finish it, will kind of create this, uh, uh, again, blending in, but standing out at the same time. Um, again, I, I, so I got a little out of order here, but again, this is, um, one of the flyers uh, for the Freedom Rally. And again, what, what's important to acknowledge here is that it's not just Martin. Martin is part of a larger story. And then again, what we wanted to do is really find ways or opportunities to sort of tell the stories, acknowledge the other people involved here. Uh, so we are working now to, uh, with King Boston, uh, as well to sort of select 65 names of other civil rights heroes to, to inlay their names in bronze within the pavers and even create ways of kind of getting in and around and to the memorial while also kind of almost going on this labyrinth-like journey of understanding these names. Um, yeah, just sort of stepping back again, we're, this is a, a view that we we like a lot. Uh, again, if it really sort of shows the sort of levels of engagement here, how you have the plaza, you have the larger uh, kind of precinct again within this tree canopy, making a place within the larger place of the common. Um, also letting this space be flexible enough for the everyday, but also becomes the sort of center of gravity for an event, for a speech, um, allowing it to have the flexibility to sort of do both. Um, yeah, uh, kind of wrapping up here, and again, another view down low, again, the idea that it, it is, it blends in, it stands out, um, uh, it, and it, again, it, it, it is something that we're really uh, uh, excited about with this project. And with that, I'll leave you with uh, uh, a mural that was commissioned, or that, that, is, that is King Boston has sort of worked on that really, again, gets starts to uh, imply how this memorial can become part of the cultural fabric of Boston um, and, and part of a, a larger story about what we memorialize and how that starts to contribute to our sense of place and, and, and belonging uh, in, in Boston. So Thank you that. so much, Jonathan. That was such a beautiful story of how it's rooted in, um, that project's really rooted in love. I love that uh, symbolism from the start. Uh, and then how you start to incorporate so many more layers and especially love your study of the perspectives uh, and the ground level view around how you 
perceive it from the different pathways and the space uh, seems really greatly flexible for what you're talking about in these future events. So thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome, thank you. Uh, so next up we have uh, Michael Evans, who is the program director from the city of Boston's mayor's office of new urban mechanics. And he is going to talk a little bit about uh, how the city is, you know, does a lot of these great pop-up tactical projects that I've had the pleasure of working with him uh, on. And he's going to talk a little bit also about us trying to get outside in the, in the wintertime and what the city is doing for us there. Take it away. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, okay, can you all see that? Mm -hmm. I hope so. All right, great. Um, and sorry, I'm uh, Jonathan, you, you sort of took my breath away with that presentation. It, I mean, it is, it's just extraordinary work. Um, anyway, so I'm Michael from uh, the mayor's office of New Urban Mechanics. And um, so we're a research and development shop within, uh, within City Hall. And what that means is that we pilot new ideas with um, great partners. So it's it's partners both external and internal. So maybe it's like a city department or maybe a community organization. So I've been working with a lot of the Main Street organizations lately, just to give you a sense of it. But you know our purview is very broad, um, and we're we're willing to partner with almost any city department or community organization. And um, you know, our topic areas are also really broad. So we're working with, you know, historically we work with the transportation department or the environment department on uh, climate resilience, uh, Boston public schools on improving the parent experience and probably like 50 other things, but just to give you a sense of what we're working on. Um, but, you know, ultimately the goal is to think about the, the future of city services. Um, in particular services that are equitable, accessible, and delightful. Um, and to, to touch on the, the last word there on delightful, you know, if you think about something like permitting or getting a sidewalk fixed on your street, you know, those aren't, I don't think people think that those are terribly fun processes to go through. Um, and so, we think about kind of the, the collection of, of city services that the city offers and, you know, you know what, what are the ways that we can help to modernize them, you know, make them more accessible, make them maybe even fun to use. Um, and uh, so going way back to 2008, 2009, uh, we were thinking about ways to make basic city services more delightful. and one of the first ideas that popped up was um, basically ended up being the city's 311 app, which was originally called Citizens Connect. And you know, if you're if if you're not familiar with it, it's an app on your phone, on iPhone or Android, that gives you um, an easy way to report problems such as damaged signs or unshuffled sidewalks. Um, and so this is just like an example of what you see in the app of the before and after and that sort of thing. And you know the this idea kind of evolved into other experiments, such as uh, this thing called City Hall to Go, uh, which was uh, a former bomb squad truck modeled after a food truck that delivered basic city services uh, throughout Boston. So, you know, if you're living in uh, in Hyde Park, for example, it's it takes a long time to get to City Hall. So, what if you just need to do something? you know, get like a marriage certificate or something, or, you know, do you, do you want to really spend the hour to get into city hall or would you prefer to go to city hall to go to, to just get it done um, when they're in the neighborhood? So that, that was kind of the concept with it, that, but there was also kind of this fun, delightful element to it as well. Um, and part of that is something I still love after all these years, which is uh, this menu of things that you could get done, done on the truck. Um, so those two ideas, like the 311 app and City Hall to Go, those were ideas that were developed internally. But, you know, I, I think the coolest thing about 
the mechanics is that we're willing to listen to any idea and we're a receptive audience for ideas. And that idea kind of got crystallized with this work that I've been doing with uh, Fields Corner Main Street, the, um, the director over there, Jack, Jackie West Devine, who kind of crystallized that thought in my, in my head that, you know, there, there were all sorts of things that she wanted to implement in Fields Corner that, you know, she just kind of needed someone to, you know, within the city hall to, to be receptive to it. And at that moment in time, we happened to be it for her. So, um, you know, I think I, I just kind of wanted to touch on that there. And, you know, if, if you all are interested in partnering with us on something, I think that would be the main takeaway uh, for, for today. Um, and so I think one way that we've tried to, I don't know if it's like actually institutionalizing it, but we wanted to put some kind of process around collaborating with folks from outside city hall, whether it's you know a designer or an artist or a community organization and working with them to implement cool ideas in public space. And so the way that we did that was through a program that we have called the Public Space Invitational. Um, so that's the, this is the, uh, a civic design competition for artists and designers and residents. And we, and we fund and support new projects in public space. So this was uh, what Emmeline was mentioning before. And actually I'm gonna mention her project in a little bit. So, um, but through, through the program, we have, uh, so we're in the seventh year of the program this year. And so, so far we've done 45 projects uh, in 15 neighborhoods. And I'm gonna touch on like maybe four or five projects that, um, that just give you a sense of what we've done through it. Um, so the, the first project is, is called Stairs of Fabulousness that, um, opened back in 20, like the end of 2014 or so. And the idea of it was, there was this frayed caution tape at the edge of the steps on the mezzanine of City Hall. And um, a local public artist and an architect named Liz LaManche came to us with this idea to replace that frayed caution tape with multicolored skateboard tape. And it really revitalized the space, it activated it. I think people were a lot more willing to you know, take a meeting on the space. Um, I mean, if you visit City Hall now, you see lots of people there. I mean, the mayor's doing her, you know, basically doing weekly press conferences there. But like back in 2012, 2013, I don't really remember anyone using it. So I think this went a long way towards, you know, revitalizing that space, you know, several years ago. Um, and this is the kind of the before and after of it. Uh, that, that I had uh, lying around. So um, the next idea is this thing called seat light control. Um, so there's a local artist and engineer named P Peter August who came to us with this idea around these, you know, these anonymous gray boxes throughout the city that, that you might see like on the left-hand side. So these control street lights. Um, on, on blocks throughout the city. So this is at the corner of Washington and Milk Street. And he came to us with this idea to replace it with this dual use structure. So it's, um, you can see on the right, it has become a bench, but on, if you can see this animated GIF on the inside, it, it's still all the electronics that uh, controls the lights on that particular block. Um, so this was, this was also kind of like a way for us to prototype new ideas with kind of like really basic city infrastructure. Um, and it, it turned out really well. Um, we've also done a ton of work with community gardens through a partnership with uh, the trustees. And they, they basically operate 56 community gardens throughout the city. And so this is a project that Emmeline had um, that Emmeline led with with Naomi with Naomi Sherman, and uh, it's basically implementing a sensory garden at a community garden in um, in East Boston. Uh, another community garden project was this, this thing called Trailer Made from uh, Andrea Fossa and Rob Barella, and they basically took a farm trailer from Texas and transformed it into this uh, community gathering space. 
And they did a series of events with it at the Fenway Victory Gardens. But the cool thing with it was that they could take it to several gardens throughout uh, throughout Boston and kind of do these pop-up events. Um, the last thing I'll touch on is kind of like the concept of winter play and winter placemaking. This is what we're currently working on right now. And um, so let me just get to my notes. Um, and so I, I think the first thing was, is that we wanted to put together uh, a winter placemaking kit that could be used to create enjoyable places in Boston in, in the winter. Um, and last year I was working with my colleague, uh, Wandi Pashwal, who um, is the Housing Innovation Design Fellow, uh, sitting between the BSA and, and new, new Urban Mechanics. And we ended up getting connected with Emmeline and, and Dina Martin from uh, their firm PCA through the Placemaking Network. And they helped us really scope and develop the idea for the Winter Placemaking Kit. Um, and now uh, a few, uh, maybe like a couple months later, we're trying to trying out a version of the kit. Um, here's a concept of it. And we're, we're working with the BSLA with uh, Gretchen Schneider, uh, Rubinkin Schneider and Rob Barella from the BSLA on basically trying out the winter placemaking kit at two events uh, coming up, uh, actually one on Saturday um, at, at the Roxbury Public, uh, Bran the, sorry, the, the Roxbury Branch Library uh, in Nubian Square. And then the following weekend uh, on March 6th uh, uh, in Fields Corner. And, you know, so we're gonna do these pop-up events and have some food trucks, try to keep people warm um, with, you know, warm drinks and food. And we have these heated seats. Um, there are some other aspects of it that, you know, if you have questions about it, let's go through them. Cause there were, there were definitely some permitting challenges here that we have, tried to figure out. Um, and I think that is about it. Um, I guess the last thing I'll leave you with is, you know, if, if we should certainly talk about the subcommittee that Emmeline had mentioned, but, you know, if, if you also just want to, you know, work with us on an idea that you might have, you know, please reach out at uh, new urban mechanics at boston.gov and, you know, there's uh, right now there's around seven of us who will get back to you and we can brainstorm, chat, whatever it is. And uh, thanks for listening. Great. Thanks a lot, Michael. That was really uh, exciting. Um, it's, it's, I think, having, having delight be a uh, factor that the city's thinking about in projects is really exciting because I think most people think, like, well, yeah, yeah, you go to the city, they got to fix the street or something. So having that be like a category of, of something that the city has, has, as a department to focus on is really exciting. So um, yeah, I definitely would look to look forward to participating with you on some of these things going forward. Great. Um, okay. Well, we're gonna keep moving forward. I guess we uh, could have mentioned earlier, we'll, we'll do a question and answer at the end, but since we have a, um, all four presenters today. I'd like to. We'd like to just get through um, everyone's stuff since it's all really exciting, and then um, we can take a question and answer period after that. And folks want to stay on uh, later. Um, that's fine with us. But we'll try to get the main show closed by six thirty. But welcome the people to stay on board for a discussion. Um, so I think um, next up we have uh, Crystal B. Uh, she's the creative civic design lead for the Design Studio for Social Intervention. Um, Krista's a multimedia artist, uh, community artist, and educator. So she's worked on participatory art projects, um, exploring themes of radical imagination, storytelling, and community care. And Krista's actually a public artist and a former Boston public school teacher. And she's, works, uh, she's working with community members to co-design creative interventions that address community issues and imagine alternative futures. So um, today, um, Excited to hear about her work with the community on sort of community engagement as uh, with the Union Square redevelopment in Somerville. So, uh, Crystal, that's all yours. Thanks so much, David. And thank you, Jonathan and Michael. It was so great to hear about the beautiful projects that y'all are working on. Um, I will share my screen.
Can you all see that? Yeah, okay, great. Um, so yeah, my name is Crystal B. I'm gonna be talking a little bit about community engagement in the Union Square Public Space Redesign Project. Mm -hmm. Oops, sorry. I can see, um, I wanna be able to um, close out some of the video. It's okay, it'll be fine. Um, but yeah, if you haven't heard of Design Studio for Social Intervention, it's an organization which applies design strategy to the improvement of civic life. And yeah, we can get into it. So um, the Union Square Plaza and Streetscape Redesign Project, or more formally, um, as it's more formally called, this project is tasked with redesigning the public sphere, so the plaza and the streetscape in Union Square. And the main goal of this redesign project is to prioritize pedestrians first and then bus mobility and, and later bike, bike transit followed by cars. Um, so this is based on the prior recommendations of the Union Square Neighborhood Plan. And just for a little bit about how we got here um, and how DS Force I got involved and I got involved, um, the city of Somerville put out an RFP and Tool won the contract to design up to 25% for the Union Square redesign project. And as part of their application, they hired DS4SI to lead the community engagement portion of the redesign project. Um, so that's what I will, I will talk about today. And as part of our partnership with this project, we were really committed to using a participatory action research method in our community engagement work. And a little bit about what PAR is, if you've never heard of it before, um, it's a methodology for research where community members have an active role in the research about their own community. And research is not extractive. Research is developed, led, and designed by the people that are most impacted by the project. So we really wanted to involve as many community members as possible from the Union Square area to, to be a part of this, the city planning process and the, the development of public space. And why, why did we choose PAR? Um, through using this PAR methodology, we were able to center value and compensate community members who bring local knowledge and unique perspectives to the city planning processes. Um, we were also able to involve residents that have been historically excluded from city planning processes to take a lead role in documenting the desires, needs, um, and needs of the community. And PAR also gave us the flexibility to bring community members um, in to lead collective imagination, um, in to lead a collective imagination project. So usually I think with a lot of city, city processes, there might be um, kind of a bringing of the designs to the community and the community might give a thumbs up or a thumbs down or, or give some feedback that way, but we really wanted to involve community members from the start of the project. So they were bringing in their input and working alongside a design consulting team that was integrating their input from the very beginning. Um, so that's how that is a little bit different than the usual kind of traditional uh, design process. Um, and this is a little bit about our hiring process. We had flyers in five different languages. We actually interviewed every single candidate that applied. So we interviewed more than 60 candidates and we did outreach to local organizations, WhatsApp groups, mutual aid groups, um, Slack channels that they had, local libraries, English language classes, churches, and more. And we ended up hiring 10 Somerville community members and they were very diverse in ages. They spoke different languages, six different languages, and they had connections with diverse users um, of Union Square and nonprofit groups as well. And this is our wonderful design community design team. That's what we're calling the participatory action research group. So these are all uh, members of the community or members of the community in Union Square that were really excited to engage their own communities in, in what they wanted to see public space, how they wanted to imagine public space. And as part of our process with PAR, it was really essential for us to orient our community design team members in the methodology and values of PAR as well as co-create an ID with them on how this team would operate and feel. And so we started with a lot of community building, establishing goals and community norms collaboratively. 
And we also did personal asset and community asset mapping so that we could really um, kind of take stock of what, what local knowledge was in the room, even before we went out to the general, like to the community, um, and also see what they were really excited about bringing their own personal skills um, and passions. Like we have one community design team member named Captain, and he is really amazing at video editing. Um, so he was able to make a lot of like promotional videos for us, which was awesome. And um, we also started with developing research questions early on. And this stemmed from conversations around belonging and what spaces feel welcoming. One of the questions we asked the team was to describe a moment where you felt like your full self in public space. Um, and a really great response around, uh, we, we got some really great responses around what they felt like um, or when they could felt like they could be their full self. Uh, some of the responses were that they, when they saw diversity in a space, when they saw that there was a lot of language accessibility, um, when the trees made them feel sheltered or reminded them of their childhood. And that really got us into the spatial justice aspect of our work. And how do we ensure that all people feel like they are included in public space and like it is for them. And they are able to be, create, thrive and connect in those spaces. Um, yeah. And this is one of the observational drawings from one of our community design team members. And I just really love including it because um, you can see all of those orange cones because there's just been so much construction in Union Square and it just shows <laughs> how frustrating that can feel and how much of the space it's, it's taking up. So a lot of data can be kind of taken from this or like um, gleaned from this, this drawing. And these are the community design team goals. These were co-created with our community design team members. Um, and I'll go into each of these in more, more detail, uh, but engage traditionally left out residents, create in-person public making opportunities, design creative engagement tools, work with the larger design team in the city of Somerville to ensure that community input is well reflected and set the bar for civic engagement. And so this portion, um, this first goal of engaging traditionally left out residents, uh, one of the big, the big ways that we were able to do this was by meeting people where they're at. That was a big tenet of what we wanted to do. We didn't wanna hold a traditional community meeting um, where people had to come to us. We wanted to meet people where they were already gathering. So we held pop-up engagements at the plaza where people were giving feedback about the plaza, but also actually in the space and using the space. So having embodied feedback or noticing that there wasn't a lot of shade and that they were hot, things like that. Um, and also at Market Basket, uh, at local activist groups and local events, for example, Evolution Hip Hop Festival. There's a lot of events in, in Somerville and in Union Square. So being able to pop up at those. And we also engage community organizations such as local youth organizations like Teen Empowerment and immigrant rights organizations. And another one of um, our, our main goals was to create in-person public making opportunities. And this is a different process than the traditional community meeting. Some of you might have been to some of those community meetings. Uh, often, if you're lucky, you might get like 25 or 30 community members. And you might notice that there isn't a ton of diversity in the room. Uh, often folks that are able to go to those meetings might be, might be white or retired homeowners who have a bit more time. And so we wanted to organize in-person po in pop-ups that welcome Somerville residents or villains as they're called back into Union Square um, and that double as ways to inspire and share new ideas for the plaza and street date. So on the left, you can see one of our community design team members, M, showing uh, one of our design tools, our creative design tools. Um, there was also art that was, um, we did like live screen printing, button making, um, folks that could weigh in on different icons, if they wanted to see more shade structures or more public art, they could then make a button out of it. Um, and they could also just be in the space and kind of imagine how they wanted to use the space in the future. If it was used for festivals, it was kind of a way to imagine, uh, reimagine that space. Um, and another big part of what the community design team does is it designs creative engagement tools. Um, 
And they were able, this was during the summer engagement, they were able to engage about 300 to 400 people at the pop-ups. Um, they, we had maps where that were covered with acetate plastic where people could draw and write down what they wanted to see in Union Square. Um, we also had these magnet boards, which I'll explain more, um, where people could give feedback about what they wanted to see in public space. We did, held focus groups and we also had a survey. Um, one of our design team members is a, an artist and he designed the, the, um, the artwork for that postcard, which had a QR code on the back. And so you could, if folks didn't have a bunch of time to talk to us, we would give them a postcard so they could stay engaged or take a survey online. And this is the magnet boards tool. I think this was our most successful tool. It was something that was inviting. It felt like um, if you were like a six-year-old child could do it, uh, like any, it felt really accessible. Um, and it had all of these icons for things that people might wanna see in public space, like special lighting, like public art, more green space, a crosswalk, more colors. Um, and folks could take a view of, um, of the plaza, so different views of the plaza, and they could place some of these icons where they wanted to see them in public space in Union Square. And we got um, almost 200 responses from this, this uh, round of engagement. Um, and through the magnet boards and the survey, we saw a lot of the same data. Um, folks really prioritized public art, planting beds, green infrastructure, tables and seatings, and trees. That was kind of our top five. Um, folks wanted places to sit, they wanted more art, um, and yeah, wanted to be comfortable. And the community design team also works with the city. This is one of our our second to last goal um, works with the city and the design consultants, and they work very, very closely with these two, these two groups. So we have weekly cross team meetings with the city of Somerville, the design consultants, um, and the design consultants. And um, the CDT is always bringing extremely valuable local knowledge and consistently holds a standard of accessibility in language and presented materials. So there can be a lot of um, kind of design jargon or sometimes as designers, we don't realize when we're, um, when we're explaining something in a way that maybe the general public won't, won't be able to understand. So the CDT has been really, really integral in making sure that those designs make a lot of sense, are easily, are easily understood at a first glance um, and are translatable for in public engagement. Um, especially as people are kind of just like passing through on the road to market basket. Is it something that people can engage with right then and give their feedback on um, as they're going about their daily lives? And finally, our last goal is that we really wanted to set the bar for civic engagement moving forward. Um, we wanted to tap into the diverse skill set of community members and, and we were able to do that with our community design team. We wanted to involve community members for the entire planning process up to 25% design. And we're almost, almost done, almost done with the project and definitely continuing to involve community members. Um, and we will be starting our next round of engagement in April and May for the spring. Um, and this will be taking all of that feedback that we received through the boards. And um, we've been working with the design consultants to create design possibilities for the plaza, for um, the plaza and streetscape. And now we're gonna go back to the community and say, did we hear you right? These are the designs that are based on your feedback from the summer. Is this, is this what you meant? Um, so really excited to bring those uh, to, to the community again. Um, and then just hoping, also looking ahead for past this project, um, I'm hoping for a continuation of deep community centered. I'm hoping for a continuation of deep community centered and community led engagement um, and hoping that it's incorporated into more city planning processes. This type of engagement is very successful involving in involving more voices that typically aren't heard in traditional city planning processes. And I truly believe that this type of engagement will create more equitable, vibrant, and inclusive public spaces that welcome and create a sense of belonging for all community members. So, 
Thank you so much. Um, please keep in touch and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Krista. I really appreciate uh, you sharing uh, your many pub public engagement tactics and especially, you know, without people, there is not a great place. So uh, that's an amazing work that you're doing. And I really wish that a lot of my projects would, would do more than, um, than just that one meeting that you're talking about where we meet the requirement. Uh, it's, it's really incredible work. Thank you for sharing. Um, and we'll try to keep each, ourselves on time. Sorry, Shauna. Um, we'll probably go a few minutes over with Shauna's presentation. We have Shauna Gilly-Smith, who's the founding principal of Ground Landscape. And she's going to talk to us a little bit about publicly owned private landscape and working with developers in the city to, to make uh, spaces better and, and how these private partnerships can really do that. Yeah, and, and uh, sorry, um, hi everybody. Thank you like very much to Emmeline and, and David and, and really interesting projects um, so far. I actually did have a question for you at the very beginning and, and I've turned my camera off because my connection's a little patchy. Should I reserve my presentation for another day, given the timing? I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that if you want to do that, because there's been such a, you know, great amount of um, interesting ideas that people might want to talk about. And I'm, I think we only have about five minutes left. So even if I were to go through, there'd be no, it's up to, it's up to you, but there'd be no, um, you know, time for discussion. Let's see. Well, um, well, let's, well, I mean, we had, yeah, we had tried to slot this for an hour till 630, but I didn't want to, we didn't want to, you know, cut yours off, although we could, you know, bring it up in the, in the next, our next one. Uh, I don't know if, if people uh, have to cut out or if, if folks don't mind staying around another till, you know, 645 or seven, or it's, then we could, we could show it. I don't know if, um, I, well, I, I'd like to say I appreciate that offer, Shauna, and um, I do want to be mindful of people's time because even if they do have time, some people are, are going to cut out. And um, I, I know that we've spoken and a ground landscape has some great information to share and they could probably do an entire presentation just themselves. And so I would hate to cut Shauna's presentation short. Uh, so, and to your point, there's been some great presentations. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Sorry to, to cut you short, Shauna. We're new to presenting and uh, being co-chairs, and so we'll be better time managers next time. Uh, so I think it, it might be a good place to stop, and that way we can give you the full time necessary to present. Yeah, Does that sound good? From, from my perspective, it's all it's totally fine. Either either way, I'm sure you can find. I'll fit into some other slot in the future, but um, but yeah, because I think there's been such interesting things already that people might want to talk about and ask about. I would just hate for anyone to miss out because we promised that you would be a presenter. So there's only that. So um, how about we open it up for questions? Does anyone have any questions? Would you like to unmute? Would anyone like to insert in the chat and offer up questions? Emily, uh, this is Frank Mead. Uh, I'm with Light Boston and uh, we would love to participate with all of these groups because uh, lighting, whether it's street lighting or, or uh, shop lighting, storefront lighting, uh, is very very important, and we're we're uh, about to launch another uh, major program. We've been in business for about 25 years as a volunteer group. Uh, we've lit uh, the old city hall and the state house and a lot of public buildings, uh, but we would like to work with with communities. So at some point, uh, I won't take any more time, but it would be something that we would be interested in. Uh, and chatting about as well. So that sounds great. I, I believe lighting is a huge part of making a, a space successful, especially at, at night. Um, so that that's great to hear your work, and we would love to get uh, something on the calendar later to possibly talk in the subcommittee further about. Does anyone else have any questions? I've got a quick question. It might be a little more crystal or some of the earlier presenters. I joined a tiny bit late. 
Um, so one question about community engagements, um, obviously, like as companies, we are starting to diversify our teams more than in the past, but we often find that sometimes when we engage with communities, um, our teams don't necessarily reflect the diversity of the communities we're working with or the um, <laughs> variety of identities available. So I guess a question for teams that have successfully done community engagements, like do you reach out to local teams to almost like join your planning and engagement team to make sure that, uh, I'll be quite frank, like that uh, our team is a lot of, uh, strategy women and Asian and white people and we're going into a lot of communities where that isn't necessarily reflecting and we're trying to think of new ways we can partner with people and whether it's business improvement districts that sort of things that are already there so it's a joint team as opposed to us coming in quote unquote as outsiders so any thoughts on that sort of disconnect that we hit all the time. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. I would love to send some resources around participatory action research. I, I really do think it's something that um, can be really, should be that local knowledge really needs to be valued and, and compensated and also can be so, so helpful in making a, a project that feels like there's ownership from the community that people, people feel like they belong in that space in whatever spaces that you're designing or I'm not sure what you're designing, um, but I, I, I'd love to talk more about, about that and, and connect because um, I do think uh, participatory action research could really be a way forward um, for, for including those voices and also making sure that whatever it is that you are designing is, 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 is felt like it's owned by the community or it, felt, it feels like the community was included in that conversation. Just a quick follow up on that, Crystal. I think as part of your presentation, you mentioned there was, um, you were able to actually hire some of those folks from the community. Was that something that's sort of like within the budget of the city? Is the city of Somerville is the client for this Union Square? Yeah, the city of Somerville. I mean, that's a great idea, but I guess somebody, it's like somebody has to sort of have a, as yeah. part of the sort of financing of the project, you can bring on some community folks. Right, right. And we, we do want to, I mean, community engagement is is work, and community knowledge um, is 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 very valuable, um, and and does that time does need to be compensated. So yeah, we were we were extremely lucky in or extremely. I, the city of Somerville did provide the funds for that, and was something that they advocated for. And it is very rare in city planning processes to involve to to pay community members throughout the entire length of the project. Um, so yeah, we'd love to see more of that happening in the city sector, but as well, I like the, the private sector as well. It could be really cool. And I think Jonathan and Michael could probably speak to this as well, but I believe the partnership um, that are created with community groups and like King Boston and, and local community groups really help that process and conversation go a lot better as well. Um, yeah, and yeah, I'll, I'll, chime, I'll chime in there. I, I think certainly, uh, I, I think an important principle here is just approaching things with honesty. And even if you, you yourself do not reflect the community you're serving, I, I think acknowledging that and, and trying to find ways to be honest about the partnership and not coming in with a certain amount of uh, pretense or um, assumptions that you know what's best. Um, uh, uh, I, I think that that's helped us uh, in a lot of our planning our work as well, where we where we are going into communities, immersing ourselves them within them, and even if we do potentially look like them, that doesn't always mean that we know their stories and know where they're coming from. So I think just being honest, I think, is the biggest thing I could sort of uh, encourage for this kind of work. Great, thank you. It's mainly curiosity. It's something that we talk about a lot and more so as teams as we're working on projects. I think the partnership is interesting. The paying community members is incredibly interesting, like as part of our team, as part of our fee is an interesting model too. Thanks. Unless anyone has any other questions. I'm gonna be mindful of everybody's time. I really appreciate all the presenters and for Shauna for giving up your time. You can fully expect to see her presentation in the future. 
because I've seen a preview and it, it looks great. Um, so thank you everybody for all your time. This was a great first event. Please reach out if you're interested in joining the subcommittee. We'd love to have you. Um, we want more voices. More voices make this process better. Or if you like to hear a presentation or a topic or um, you know anything, uh, just reach out. What David and I are very willing to just have a conversation. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Bye. Bye.